Shalom Mikulam. Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Gross. I'm a senior fellow here at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center in Jerusalem. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to uh, to welcome you to our uh, most recent uh, webinar Zoom conversation uh, with an expert. We've been doing a number of these. Well, we've been doing these for actually a few years, but specifically since October 7th, we've been doing a number of these on issues relating to the war and and um, topics around that. Um, what we're going to do today is focus on the north of Israel. Um, for understandable reasons, the we tend to read more and hear more about what's happening in the south. Um, that's where obviously the fighting, or certainly most of the fighting is, that's where our hostages are. Um, and that's also where tra tragically many soldiers are losing their lives. Um, so that's where the, the focus tends to be. But um, it would be a mistake not to um, understand better what is happening in the north of Israel and the threat that Israel faces from Hezbollah, um, partly because it's, as we're going to hear, affecting in very real terms the Israeli citizens in the north. Um, uh, but also because, uh, again, as we're going to hear, uh, if uh, the, the potential of the threat from Hezbollah um, actually dwarfs the threat from Hamas, um, so we're going to uh, we're going to discuss that as well. Um, I have really the very, the perfect person to um, discuss this with um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Sarit Zahavi, who's the founder and president of Alma, which is a non-profit and independent research and education center specialized in Israel security challenges on its northern border. Uh, Sarit has briefed hundreds of groups and forums, including uh, senior politicians from the United States uh, and elsewhere, and visiting VIP groups. Uh, she's written a number of petition papers and updates focusing on Lebanon, Syria, and Israel's national security challenges. Uh, her background includes 15 years in the IDF, including uh, specializing in military intelligence. She has an MA in Middle East Studies from Ben Gurion University, and in 2021, the Jerusalem Post listed her as one of the top 50 most influential global Jewish personalities. So, Sarit Zahavi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, so let's um, let's start with uh, a general question. Um, my assumption is that not everyone here is fully aware of what's going on, some more than others. Um, as usual, we have a group of uh, people from Israel and outside Israel. Um, but can you tell us just, Bogadol, as they say, in general, what What's, what is happening in the north of Israel? What, what's it like for the people living there? And what is it that's led to, what is it, some 80,000 um, no longer living in their homes in the north at the moment? So uh, actually the war started here in October 8th. And since then Hezbollah is launching uh, various types of munitions, beginning from uh, drones, UAVs, anti-tank missiles that are that is an accurate uh, weapon and uh, actually not necessarily against tanks in uh, most cases against homes against buildings uh, we had 2300 uh, rockets that were launched uh, by Hezbollah uh, since this war started not including these anti-tanks that I've mentioned um, these rockets are mostly inaccurate, but they also used accurate missiles, it, it looks like, by, by the hits. Uh, heavy rockets of uh, the names are Burkan and Falak 1, which are heavy rockets, and it, that's why it's more challenging to intercept. And what started from October 8th of around two attacks every day uh, got to the average of around eight. Uh, sometimes it's five, sometimes it's ten, sometimes it's more. In most cases, it's uh, to the border areas, uh, to communities that are evacuated, uh, zero to five uh, kilometers from the border. That's 60,000 people that were evacuated by the order of the Israeli government. And by the way, the, yesterday the Israeli government uh, announced that it's going to extend the compensation to these people until July, meaning they are not going to go back to their homes until July. Uh, While well, until today they lived, until yesterday they live in a very high uncertainty because they didn't know when this compensation is will end. 
and they were all living in hotels they couldn't even rent apartments in this kind of situation although only those who have the economic capability and uh, they, they didn't know how this is going to end when this is going to end it's a family in one small room of a hotel and uh, the collapse of, of the community these are all very small communities and there are also a uh, two towns one Kriyat Shmona is 23,000 people uh, most of them are left and uh, Shlomi it's 6,000 people and all the rest is small communities so it's a gradual collapse of the community structure and of the family structure and you know that Israelis are very family oriented and the fact that they live in hotels in the past four months with no hope and no prospect of how this is going to end it creates a lot of psychological uh, difficulties we don't have uh, the authority of free rehabilitation like there is in the south and uh, so we get uh, much less uh, services i am i myself by the way not evacuated i live nine kilometers from the border we feel uh, the war here means that we hear the sounds of war uh, day and night uh, we hear the heat we hear the idf artillery with retaliation uh, we hear um, the jets, we hear the drones, we don't always know whether it's a Hezbollah drone or an Israeli drone. Uh, so the sounds of war are uh, around the clock over here, and sometimes there are alerts as well. Uh, that's, that's the daily life here. Uh, 900 drones were launched uh, against Israel since this war started. Most of them came from Lebanon. Many of them were intercepted. And it's the ant, uh, untold, uh, the secret war. Nobody knows. Everybody's calling it the uh, Israel-Hamas war, but it's definitely not Israel-Hamas war in the experience of the people that are living here. Right. Yeah, I think that's, that's I, I think that's one of the big um, uh, sort of, you know, the Rim Shorim Mipo, Lori Misham, right? What you see from here, you don't see from there. Like outside Israel, I think people see it as the Israel-Hamas war. And here, Israelis are experiencing it as, as a regional war conflict right hezbollah the houthis um iran behind it all and that's that i think is very is very powerful you mentioned that already october 8th hezbollah we're getting into this so hezbollah obviously is you know is part of this the same uh, iranian backed um axis of resistance or whatever you want to call it against israel um but from what we understand, um, Hamas has been disappointed that Hezbollah hasn't done more than it has. There seems to be some sense that Hamas were hoping, expecting that Hezbollah would o really open like a, a serious, not I mean serious, it's serious enough, but a second front in the sense that Israel would be faced with a full scale war on the northern border, which hasn't happened. In your assessment, why has that not happened? So first, uh, to be honest with you, there are many assessments, different kind of assessments. In a, even in my center, in Alma Center, we have different opinions around that. Uh, I think that uh, eventually Hezbollah uh, was interested in war before October 7th, and it is interested in uh, more escalation after October 7th, except it is not interested in an escalation on behalf of the Palestinian cause or behalf of the Hamas cause. It is interested in cultivating its image as the protector of Lebanon. And actually what is it, it is trying to do since the past two years, actually, not, not since October 7th, is to try to drag Israel into war. We've seen a lot of provocations before October 7th on the borderline. We've seen actually preparations for an invasion uh, on the borderline. I myself saw the Hezbollah on the border every day when I was there. I saw the military positions of Hezbollah and the watching towers. They took photos of me. They were spying on me. Uh, it was a these were very troubling sites back then. Uh, last Passover, they launched, uh, Hamas launched a few tens of rockets from Lebanon. Hamas couldn't have done that without the assistance of Hezbollah. Uh, a few tens of rockets, by the way, intercepted just above my home. And uh, I am I am speaking to you from my small bomb shelter at home. I had my whole family at home back then. Imagine uh, mm -hmm. what it's like to tell your 30 guests, OK, you know what? We are not going to the shelter. Let's stay outside and uh, film the interceptions because my shelter is too small. What would I do? Um, and, to, and to stay calm. So <laughs> uh, 
So Hezbollah was trying to drag Israel into war, and I think that eventually what happened now is that Hezbollah put Israel in an unbearable situation, knowing that eventually Israel will have to do something. The French and the Americans uh, were full power in getting a diplomatic uh, arrangement in the past uh, few weeks, and Hezbollah just uh, said very clearly, there is not going to be a diplomatic arrangement until, as long as there is fighting in Gaza, which, you know, the fighting in Gaza is not going to stop that quickly, even if there will be a deal, Israel said that it wants to, uh, you know, finish the job, defeat Hamas after a, a ceasefire in Gaza. So we don't understand how, how all of that is going to play out. What I what's important for me to to say is that you know Hezbollah didn't change. It it has the same interest, which is distributing the Islamic Revolution values, and taking over Lebanon to enable it to to turn it into a complete Islamic state. Uh, and the the campaign against Israel is one of the tools uh, on on the way to do that. Uh, Hezbollah didn't change. Hamas didn't change. Uh, they had the. Uh, the military capabilities that we will discuss probably in a minute. But we changed. Israel has changed. And we are not willing anymore to, to live under this kind of threats and under the threat of a massacre, which is, uh, you know, it's in the most personal uh, levels of, uh, uh, how should I put it, of the, the deepest fears that we have as parents that are living here. Yeah. You know, the first thing I had done when, when I heard that uh, Hamas, uh, Nukba, got all the way to Ofakim was to check how far is Ofakim from the border with Gaza. And then I checked how, much is, how, how far is my town from the border with Lebanon. And I find out that I'm closer. Yeah, much closer. Can you just say something about, it for residents of the north, um, what's the exact, like, what's what are the, what's the exact nature of the threat that's 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 led eighty thousand people to leave their homes is it the aerial the, the aerial bombardment is it also the possibility of tunnels like we saw from gaza um look when this war started nobody could promise us that hezbollah will not invade uh, into israel the same way hamas had done um I can try and share with you a, a video that uh, looks like the offensive plan uh, of Hezbollah uh, to invade to, to the Gali. Uh, the, the video was published in Hezbollah TV station uh, actually a decade ago, hmm. uh, a decade ago. And I, I, you know, I forgot all about it uh, until October 7th. And then I, I, I opened this video. It was in my computer. I guess you can see it now. Yeah. And I was amazed to see that the Hezbollah offensive plan that was published a decade ago in Lebanon to take over the Galilee is completely similar to what Hamas had executed uh, from Gaza. And this is uh, propaganda of Hezbollah. Okay, it's not a secret, it's not intelligence, whatever. The idea is to start from a barrage of rockets, artillery against the Galilee. I don't know if you can see my clicker. I live somewhere in this area. Hmm. Um, and then uh, forces will invade into Israel from various areas along the borderline while each force will have its own mission meaning each force will know to e e uh, to which community it is heading whether it's Nariya, whether it's shlomi carmiel whatever uh, just like hamas knew exactly where they are going then uh, the idea was to trap civilians to become human shields it is said specifically in the video the video also talks about blocking the main roads so Israelis uh, will not get help and assistance and enforcement. Uh, it, it talks about uh, getting uh, invading from, from the seashore as well. And you can see the boats now. 
And when I saw this video, as I've said, including the sick idea of getting of uh, taking civilians as human shields uh, to become human shields, taking them as hostages, uh, this is uh, exactly what Hamas had done with all the details around it. It's exactly what Hamas had done, except this this plan was not written in Gaza. It was written, I don't know, in Beirut, in Tehran, whatever. That's how it looks like. And when I saw that, look, I knew, okay, I knew. We knew that there are Radwan brigades in Hezbollah. We knew that they are more experienced than Hamas because they participated in, uh, in uh, the war in Syria. We knew exactly what we were supposed to face. And yet, and I think this can also answer some questions about the South. As Israelis that are personally threatened by this, we had kind of a psychological barrier to imagine an invasion of thousands of combatants. And uh, I can tell you that if we had met on the border like six months ago, I would probably tell you, if you ask me what's the scenario, I will tell you that uh, the scenario of Raduan brigades, the commando units of Hezbollah, is to invade one or two communities and very quickly the IDF will arrive and within a few hours the whole incident will end with a few casualties to Israelis. We couldn't imagine what happened. And today, uh, after what happened in the South, we cannot not imagine what may happen and what was supposed to happen. So this is one very clear threat. And we are, we are very much worried from an option of a massacre, of another massacre. Uh, we understand that the IDF today is much more prepared than it used to be. But it is also based on reservists, and it cannot keep them uh, drafted forever. Now, by the way, they, most of them were released, and it's more uh, compulsory service soldiers, but you need to change forces all the time. Uh, it's a great challenge to defend a border uh, with a, a, bear, a, a very weak barrier. V not all, everywhere there is a wall. Only less than half of it is walled most of it is with a poor fence an active and hostile border and uh, to defend that with only uh, compulsory service uh, soldiers uh, it's a border of the defense is around 100 kilometers uh, it's not a straight line it goes like this the second threat and the second uh, um, problem that we can uh, discuss is the rockets and missiles array uh, of Hezbollah, which is um, 10 times more, 10 times bigger than uh, what we learned about Hamas. If we were told that Hamas has uh, around 15 to 20,000 uh, missiles with Hezbollah, the numbers are 10 times more. Uh, we're talking about 140 mortars, which are for very short range, uh, only around the borderline. But uh, we are also talking about 65,000 missiles that can get to uh, a few kilometers, uh, about 30, a few tens of kilometers from the border. That's around Haifa. Okay, it sounds very short range, 30 kilometers. What 30 kilometers? But 30 kilometers, it's all of the Galilee. That's uh, 300,000 people. And you have uh, others which can get to different kind of ranges. And I must tell you, all of this arsenal that I'm showing you here does not include the anti-tank missiles that well that are that became from a tactical weapon, became a strategic weapon since this war started, because uh, Hezbollah is using them not only against tanks, and we don't have protection against these missiles. So this is the the two, these are the two main threats that we're talking about, whether it's the missiles and, and artillery or a, a Radwan brigades and the ground, the option of a ground invasion. <clears throat> so, from, Israel, if, from Israel's point of view, this, it's faced with a situation where, as you've described it, Hezbollah is at some point looking to um, provoke a war with Israel. Um, as you said, not for the Palestinians, but for their own purposes. Um, can Israel either afford to wait until that happens? In which case, how do they protect the people, in the, the people, the residents of the north? 
Um, if not, if they're not prepared to wait, is there is it in the interests uh, of the uh, of Israel for 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 the Israeli government itself to effectively embark on a on a um, an offensive against Hezbollah, um, or is there a diplomatic option? Because we, some of you on the on this Zoom may recall um, that um, somewhat 18 years ago, um, we had um, the Second Lebanon War, which ended with a ceasefire um, brokered by the United Nations, in which a UN resolution 1701 was supposed to <laughs> supposed to disarm Hezbollah and see Hezbollah retreating. Uh, Sarit will tell me, but a certain number of miles, kilometers away from the border behind the, away behind the Litani River, um, and that hasn't happened. So what's the, um, what, what's the, is there, is there a diplomatic option? What might it look like? Do you see it as feasible? There is a diplomatic option, and I would like to, you know, start this very important discussion from the diplomatic option. Um, theoretically, there is a diplomatic option. Right. Now, let's see if I will be able to win against uh, technology and uh, to share the PowerPoint with you, because I want to show you, um, I don't know how to screen it when I have one screen. <clears throat> um, let's see. Okay. That way I can see you. Okay, I'm going to show you the PowerPoint, but I'm not going to screen it, and I hope it's good enough. Yeah, that's fine. Do you see that now? How is yeah. that? Yeah, we can all see that. So 1701 is a UN Security Council resolution that was made uh, to end the previous war between Israel and Hezbollah in 2006. The idea was to create a, an area, as you can see here, free of any armed personnel, assets, weapons, whatever, uh, in the area between the Blue Line, which is the border, and the Litani River, which is around 25 kilometers from the Blue Line. Um, who should enforce this, who should make sure that there is no Hezbollah over there? The surprise is that the word enforcement doesn't exist in the resolution. And what we end up with is this article that says that uh, the mission of the Lesbani, of the UNIFIL, which is today a 10,000 uh, soldiers force, a United Nations interim force to Lebanon, the, its mission is to assist the Lebanese armed forces in taking towards the establishment of this area, uh, as mentioned, the blue line, no enforcement. First problem. And second problem, Israel is, uh, during the year said, but UNIFIL should have the mandate. UNIFIL have the mandate. And UNIFIL continued to stick to this article, actually the rest of the world, to this article 11 saying, no, we don't have the mandate. But actually, if you read this very long article here, what you get is that actually UNIFIL should, by the resolution, do everything it can uh, to make sure that the area uh, in, under its mandate will not be used for any uh, hostile activity, any violent activity against uh, the State of Israel. That's the area we are talking about, okay? I hope you can see my clicker. That's the blue line. That's the Itani River. Basically, this is UNIFIL area of operation. And this resolution never had a deadline. So no enforcement, no deadline. And today, the suggestions that we hear of a diplomatic arrangement are not even talking about the 25 kilometers. They are talking about 8 to 10 kilometers. And they are not talking about the establishment of uh, this kind of region with no weapons, as you saw in the article. They are talking about the pushback, I'm quoting, the pushback of Hezbollah from the borderline. Now, this is something we all have to understand. You cannot push back somebody who lives there. Hezbollah is not an external army that occupied South Lebanon. Hezbollah is entrenched in the Lebanese towns 
and it is completely part of the uh, South Lebanese uh, narrative, daily lives, uh, civilian services, everything you can talk about when you talk about a community in South Lebanon. Hezbollah is there wherever you look, doesn't matter whether it's civilian or military. And that's why to talk about a pushback is not, it's not, it's just don't, not understanding the reality. We can talk about disarmament. We can talk about taking off the missiles and the tunnels and the rockets of Hezbollah from the homes. But the big question is who is going to do that? Who is willing to clash with Hezbollah in order to do that? Because Hezbollah made it very clear that it is not going to participate in the battle. So this is with regard to the diplomatic arrangement and there are a few more problems which are even more complicated which is a land dispute i'm doing like this because actually it's an invented land dispute that the lebanese insisted on creating and hezbollah joined the party and after the un recognized the israeli withdrawal from lebanon lebanese continue to say that israel is taking lebanese land and build a whole narrative around it <laughs> That's, you know, I, I don't know how are we going to get to any effective arrangement at, yeah, at, yeah. At, at the moment. Now, the second option that everybody's talking about is a full-scale war, okay? If we cannot get our people back uh, to their homes uh, safely with the diplomatic arrangement, so we will go to war, we will fight Hezbollah and everything, peace and love in the Middle East. It's not like that because every option has a price. And if we are going to war, it's going to be more challenging. We're going to have more casualties. We're going to have more uh, rockets, as you saw. Uh, it's going to take more time. And we're going to have less international legitimacy to do that. Mm. Uh, so it comes with a very high price that I'm not sure that my leadership is willing to pay. Yeah. So what's, what's, what's left? I think that what the, my leadership is trying to do now is kind of going uh, between the drops, meaning trying to maximize a military achievement below the scale of a full war. And that's why you see today attacks against Hezbollah military operatives in, in Lebanon, attacks against uh, warehouses in Lebanon. Today was an interesting day because Hezbollah shot down <coughs> a, an IDF drone, not a small drone, big drone, advanced drone. Uh, it's the first time that it succeeded in shooting down an Israeli drone like that. And Israel retaliated harshly uh, with an attack against Hezbollah military targets uh, deep in uh, in Lebanon, in 100 kilometers in Lebanon. That's far away. Oh. And also uh, targeted the Hezbollah commander uh, in South Lebanon. So this is how eventually by doing that every day, and this is being done every day, so we kind of go to a circle of action, reaction, action, reaction. By doing that, we, you get a lot of military achievement. We already killed around 215 military operatives uh, since this war started. By doing that every day, with this one is 216, um, maybe we can have a sufficient military achievement until we, we will be imposed to have a ceasefire. There are two problems with this scenario. One, nobody knows. Uh, whether IDF succeeded in truly damaging the capabilities of Hezbollah. Uh, what we can say very clearly is that Hezbollah strikes continue every day with all these arsenal that I've mentioned. <clears throat> That's one thing. And second, each time there is an IDF attack like that, and uh, there is a huge explosion in Lebanon of, I don't know, a weapon where, warehouse or whatever, it's another, we are taking the risk of war. We are taking the risk of, of uh, getting out of control. So that's why I said that to predict how, how this exactly is going to, to play out, uh, it's irresponsible. I don't know. I don't sit in the Israeli cabinet. But I think that there will be a point that decisions will have to be made because we need to get the people back and people are afraid to go back. They are afraid to go back. They were evacuated because of the risk for another massacre and now they are afraid to go back because of these anti-tank shootings and as i've said not only against tanks where iron dome is ineffective because a, a lot of rockets are also not intercepted by iron dome and landing uh, in in the israeli towns and there are about 500 buildings that were uh, damaged since this war started 
by the Hezbollah artillery. In wow. Israel, I didn't talk about Lebanon. Yeah. In Israel. <laughs> um, just, to be, just to clarify, when you said 216 um, operatives killed by the IDF, we're talking, that's just, that's Hezbollah, right? We're not talking, this is, we're not, this is, we're talking about the North. This is, that's about, just this Hezbollah. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't even include other factions in Lebanon, which right. they had right. a little bit of casualties as well. Right, right. Uh, one and it's just question. military operatives. There were a few uh, Lebanese civilians who were killed as well. Right, right. Um, one last question for me before we get to questions from the audience. There's always this question as to as to the extent of Iran's control <coughs> over Hezbollah, right? We know that Hezbollah is not just, it's not like Hamas, right? It's not just sort of funded and supported by Iran. It's actually, uh, unlike Hamas, it's a Shiite uh, ideological ally of the Islamic revolution, right? It's, you know, you Hezbollah... Hezbollah have like pictures of the Ayatollah Khomeini on their wall. It's not that that's that's the nature of the relationship. But how but how independent are Hezbollah? Because the reason I ask the question is the Iranians, for all that they're obviously very happy to see um, Israelis in trouble, um, the Iranians might not want Hezbollah to embark on a full scale war with Israel. Um, which, although it will cause a lot of damage to Israel, could also lead to the complete decimation of Hezbollah. That's not in Iran's interest, surely, at this point. Is that, do, do, I'm, am I clutching at straws? <laughs> what, what's your view? Like, how do you think the This Iran is a, a nice way to have a psychological warfare spread in lies. Okay. Um, no, I don't think these reports were correct. Okay. I think that Iran was completely interested in a multi-front campaign against the state of Israel. Mm. I just think that we didn't understand what does that mean. Okay, we thought multi-front campaign against the state of Israel should look the same in all fronts. While the Iranians thought they should cultivate, as you said, different kind of militias, different kind of proxies, yeah. uh, with different interests, give them the capabilities, and then like an octopus, each of them can operate in a different way. I don't think that Iran is putting any pressure on Hezbollah uh, not to escalate. I think that the situation that was created now is very comfortable for Iran and for Hezbollah because they uh, gain an achievement uh, which is evacuation of 60,000 Israelis. And again, if there will be war, this is what they were interested in in the past uh, two years. Okay, they, they can deal with that. There will be a lot of damages to Lebanon. They are completely aware of that. Yeah. But if they are comparing that to the previous war with Israel, they learn that 17 years afterwards, they become stronger. Okay, now let's talk about the relationship. So I can put it this way. If you own a small business and you have, uh, like I'm the president of Alma, okay? And I have a CEO, right? Uh, he is my most, uh, I don't know, senior manager in the organization. That's Hezbollah. It's the most senior manager of the organization. You're not going to fire him that quickly. You need to listen to his uh, uh, needs. And when he tells you this, this, and, and that I cannot do because this, this, and that reason, you work with him and not against him. Okay? You trust him. This is Hezbollah. Hezbollah work hand in hand with Iran. But also, you hire a freelance to do, I don't know, your social media, and you hire a freelance to do some translations and video editing, and I don't know what. This is Hamas. Hamas is a freelance. It's not Shiite, it's Sunni. Uh, and it's a, it's a partnership that is not based on, uh, you know, all sharing all values. It is different. It's a different kind of partnership. Okay? Uh, Iran provided Hamas as a Sunni militia, weapons, it was in the interest of Iran to, uh, it was kind of a courtship, actually, of Iran uh, after Hamas, to provide them weapons, to provide them training. So it's funny, you know, we saw the courtship and we couldn't believe they are getting so much from Iran. How come they need to courtship? Hamas uh, didn't do that at the beginning. But eventually what they did is they sacrificed Hamas. It was the, you know, win-win. They, Hamas uh, made this campaign, 
now they can learn how everybody responds uh, from tactical levels to strategic levels and uh, they sacrifice the Arab Sunnis. Okay, small price to pay right. in their point of view. Right. But what the but the but in terms of Lebanon, because obviously Hezbollah <laughs> Hezbollah doesn't I mean Hezbollah doesn't answer to the Lebanese government, far from it, right? It can the Lebanese government has no power to stop Hezbollah doing whatever it wants. Um but does Hezbollah at least have to consider its um its place in Lebanon, meaning if it embarks on a war with Israel and the result of that war is, you know, d disaster for the, for the state of Lebanon, is that something that might make Hezbollah think twice? I'm not sure. Right. <clears throat> and I'll tell you why I'm not sure, because if Hezbollah was that worried of the destruction of Lebanon, why did it hide its weapons in the civilian infrastructure? Why did it hide its weapons in the homes and under the homes and in the schools? Why did it excavate tunnels inside these towns? Uh, why would Hezbollah worry about the destruction of, in Lebanon if what happened after the previous war is that there was a lot of destruction, fine, and then there was a lot of money that came in and Hezbollah became 17 years backwards instead of 17 weeks backwards Hezbollah became much stronger. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, I, I learned that from people who are experts to Iran, that uh, Iran is playing chess and we are playing soccer. Uh, and maybe even something which is shorter than soccer. D they don't look uh, on, on, and I think Hezbollah is the same in this, they don't look at, the, they don't build their strategy for a year or two. They build their strategy for something longer. And when you look at that this way, you understand that, okay, uh, there will be destruction in Lebanon. We can deal with that. And after, you know, if, if we look in 15 years uh, forward, we will take over Lebanon because all the others will leave. There will be no hope for the Lebanese. And this is what they want. Right. Okay. Um, all right, well, thank you for answering my questions. I've get, we're going to get to the questions now that we've, that have been put to us through the from the audience with us um you can keep those coming in uh there's a question from uh isabel who asked about it's really a question about the the division of troops between between the north and the south so um she heard that uh, israel's pulling some troops out of gaza and sending them to the north um and she asked is that something that will um that will hinder the chances of success in gaza and is that or, like how do you see this division of of um of uh, troop deployment i guess in the north and south? In, in general i would say that in every war you take the, the the troops to the south and then you transfer them to the north and then you bring them back the idea of uh, sending uh, forces uh, we call it to freshen up uh, for a few weeks at home and then go back uh, and then then you have to recalculate this is very natural and we are doing that a lot Second, uh, the war in Gaza is uh, uh, practically we have only Rafah. We don't need the amount, the same amount of forces that was needed when the invasion to Gaza started. Right. Uh, we don't know how this is going to play out in the north. And I totally understand uh, if uh, IDF, I'm not sure it is enforcing more. Uh, it enforced the, there are much more soldiers here since the war started. I'm not sure I can say that uh, today they are more than it used to be in November, for example, okay? Mm -hmm. It's just different forces, okay? As I've said, it's more a uh, compulsory service and it's less reservist because eventually after four months the reservists spent here, they had to, to send them uh, to be home a little bit. Okay. Um, Sandy asks whether when the communities uh, hopefully in the north do go back home um are there has there been damage to infrastructure are there schools and hospitals and things will be functioning to be able to take them back is there any problem with that a little bit damage uh, again i said 500 buildings were damaged in all the communities and uh, in different levels damage can be a broken window and can be a direct hit right it's not the same damages as you saw down south, definitely not. 
there were damages that were uh, uh, caused by the IDF itself because if you want to protect the kibbutz that is based on the border from an invasion of Hezbollah and you bring tanks into the kibbutz, there is a damage in the kibbutz. Uh, this also can happen. <clears throat> the problem is to bring the people. How yeah. do we bring back the people feeling safe enough feeling with the young family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... So David asks a question, which I guess is a sort of an extension of my comment about comment question about Lebanon. Um, he says, uh, is there a, is can we avoid dragging all of Lebanon into a war with Hezbollah? Because he says Hezbollah is also part of the Lebanese government. Um, units of Hezbollah serve in the Lebanese army. Army. Can we avoid dragging all of Lebanon into the war? No, to me it's clear that it's not war with Hezbollah. It's war with Lebanon that is captured in the hands of Hezbollah. Right, right. And I think Israel's made that clear. If I remember, one of the... Israel made clear that unlike... In 2006, there was an attempt to make a distinction between Hezbollah and the Lebanese government. And the Lebanese government at the time was quite... Was also made that distinction, saying we don't want to have anything to do with this. I think now that's not the case, right? That's not the case, because as you said, Hezbollah is a member of the Lebanese government, it is a member of the Lebanese parliament. Uh, I believe that Israel will not open fire against uh, Lebanese armed forces unless there is a direct risk from, from, from them. Right. Right. Um, uh, in question here from Joel, who says, what are the types of fortifications that Israel has along the border of Lebanon to stop the invasion? Let's see if I can find a nice photo to, to answer this question. Basically, as I've said, uh, most of the border is, uh, is walled, is, uh, sorry, is fenced. I don't know, around 30% uh, is walled. Um, I'll show you a picture that I took from the border of how it looks like, and you will understand that, I'm sorry, it's not very impressive, neither the, the wall nor the fence. Um, this is how the wall looks like, and you see Hezbollah taking photos of me just behind it. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, another one, uh, standing there with uniforms. This is how the fence looked like. Uh, and this is Hezbollah standing behind the fence. He also took photos of me. Uh, in this area, there is a wall. This tower was already hit uh, by the IDF. It's a Hezbollah watching tower. It used to be a Hezbollah watching tower. Here you can see the fence and the wall and a watching tower of Hezbollah. That as I've said, this one was bombed as well. So these are just examples. This is the fence. You can see it's rusty. It's low. Uh, this is Hezbollah military operative looking at us. And this is his position. And this is right next to where the two soldiers were kidnapped in 2006. Just examples of how the border looks like and the terrain is very different from Gaza by the way. Uh, it's all hills, valleys and trees. Now in the winter it's it's a nightmare because you can't see anything. If it's a rainy day you can't see a meter free from you. It's challenging. Well, wow. um, okay. Um... There are a few questions about about the basically what it would take for um, if there was a ceasefire, um, say you know, comprehend some sort of ceasefire both in both in the north and the south. Um, one of our audience asked uh, how would how would residents in the north feel secure that a ceasefire was you know was worth was could be trusted in some way. Um, that it would hold. Um, what kind of um, what could be done in order to make to, to, to beyond a full scale war, which gets rid of Hezbollah, right? What could be done to to make northern residents feel safe and secure to go back to their homes in the event? My of worst, season? my worst nightmare. Yeah, is a ceasefire under the uh, version of uh, what the French does just offered. As I've said, a few kilometers from the border, pushing back, which is a meaningless uh, a term, 
uh, with the enforcement of Unifil and Lebanese army. That's, that's my worst nightmare, because this would mean that we, Hezbollah get to preserve its military capability, gets to preserve its capability to massacre us, and that it's only a matter of time until this will happen to us. Uh, it's my worst nightmare in the most personal levels. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a ceasefire can be a solution only if there is a deadline for the disarmament, not withdrawal, disarmament of Hezbollah in these areas, only if there is a, an effective monitoring and enforcement mechanism and there are no conditions to Israel whatsoever. Is there, is there a feasible incentive that could be offered to Hezbollah to disarm? Is there something, is there anything, why would Hezbollah disarm beyond, beyond the threat of an, Israeli, <laughs> of an Israeli attack which would wipe Hezbollah out? Our uh, biggest mistake with Hamas was that we thought we can deter a terrorist organization with the cost of lives. If you take uh, the previous operations, uh, small operations in Gaza in the past few years, uh, it cost Hamas with the lives of commanders uh, or Islamic Jihad. Yeah. Uh, this is not enough. Okay? This uh, culture is the culture of death. They cherish death while we cherish life. So the whole perception of deterrence cannot be based on our values. It should be different. The fact that they already, uh, you know, lost 215 military operatives, it's, it has nothing to do with deterrence. Yeah. Uh, the only way to deter a terrorist organization is to make it understand that if it will try to massacre Israelis, it will fail. If it will try to bomb Tel Aviv, it, it doesn't have the capabilities, for example. Okay. That, that's the only way to make sure that they don't, they hardly have the capability. You know what? I will not say they don't. They hardly have the capability. They are not going to succeed in doing what they plan. Um, and that's why it's either disarmament or military uh, operation at this scale or another, but a military elimination of these threats. Right. Okay. Um, it's a question from Sherry who says, why are they attacking hard dog? Is there some history there? Yes, very good question. Maybe I have a map. <laughs> yeah, maybe that. Yeah, I think it would be helpful for people who don't know where Hardov is. Yeah. Or um, where did I put this map? <clears throat> Give me a minute to find it. Sure. Uh, yes, after, as I've said, after we had withdrawal uh, from Lebanon in May 2000, uh, the United Nations uh, recognized our withdrawal and uh, said, okay, Israel had withdrawn, no problem. The Lebanese from their part uh, said that they have uh, 13 reservations uh, on the borderline, from, uh, from the borderline that was uh, marked by the UN. Yeah. And you can see these uh, 13 reservations here in my map. And on top of that, they added uh, this is uh, Sheba Farms or Mount Dove, okay? It's a very beautiful high up area. But if you stand on top, maybe I have these photos here, I'm not sure. Uh, if you stand on top, <clears throat> you can, uh, I don't have a photo. Um, you can uh, see through all over uh, the, oh, I have a nice photo to show you. You can see all over the Gali, you can see uh, all over South Lebanon. You have an amazing, amazing view. That's why it's actually a strategic area. Also, there is a lot of water that is coming down from this area of Mount Dove. Uh, into, I took this photo. I was there three days before October 7th. Hmm. Um, what you see here is mostly South Lebanon. Right. Um, so you can see for a distance, you have the control over the sources of the water. And the bottom line is that actually, if you go back to my map again, we didn't take this area from uh, Lebanon. 
We took it from Syria with the Golan uh, in 1967. Uh, you can see this is part of this area. After we had withdrawn from Lebanon and the United Nations recognized our withdrawal, Lebanon said, uh uh, this area is also Lebanese. And Israel said, but we took it from Syria. We will discuss this with Syria. Lebanon said, no, we will, this is Lebanese. We want these areas back. This is how the three more points here uh, were created. And they're also saying that the northern part of this town named Rajar is Lebanese. The UN is saying it's Lebanese. And the southern part should be Lebanese as well. Because as I've said, we took it from Syria. They claim it's theirs. So at least what they want now is to get to the northern part of Rajar. These are Israeli citizens. Okay, yeah. These are Arab Alawites, Israeli citizens. It's a humanitarian problem. And then they themselves don't think they are Lebanese. They are saying we are either Israelis or Syrians, but we are not Lebanese. Doesn't Syria have something to say about this? No. <laughs> Surprisingly enough. <laughs> no. I guess it's Syria. It's not it in Syria. say anything. <laughs> right. It's not in Syria's interest to, uh, to, help, to help Israel out in this, of course. Um, right. Okay. Uh, ah, and one more thing around that. Wait, I want to show you. This is Rajar, okay, and the northern part of Rajar is over, uh, over here. And another another thing around that is that Hezbollah isn't satisfied with all of these as a conflict, and added another. Uh, how should I put it? Another cherry uh, to to make sure that the conflict will never be solved, okay? And it published that not only Israel is taking uh, the northern part of Rajar and Sheba farms and 13 reservations of the Lebanese, but also seven villages. What is the story of these seven villages? This is part of the negotiation between British mandate and French mandate a hundred years ago. These towns were Shiite towns. Uh, in a gradual process, they disappeared until in 48, they disappeared completely. And the border, as you see today, the blue line here, was created by marking it in the terrain by the French and the British. There is no question about the border, but Hezbollah question, is questioning the border, no. saying that these seven towns, since they were Shiites, should be in Lebanon. Um, I don't see how we can solve the conflict this way. Right. Yeah, that seems... Uh... But, but I want to emphasize, it's not about land. Even right. everything I've just said, it's not about land. It's about the basic fact that Hezbollah doesn't recognize the very existence of the state of Israel. Yeah. Th that's it. It's not about land. Right. Yeah, that should, uh, I think that's, that's, uh, that should be clear to everyone. Um, there was a question, uh, something we actually didn't mention in our, in our conversation earlier. Um, when we talked about the reasons why Hezbollah did not um, respond in the way that Hamas would have wanted them to in a full-scale assault. How much of that was to do with the American response, with the, the introduction of a, of a huge carrier ship into the Mediterranean, Biden saying, don't, in that very uh, definite way? Um, is that, did that have some impact, that the, 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 the Lebanese, that Hezbollah, <coughs> sorry, that Hezbollah and Iran saw that America, at least certainly in those early weeks, um, was sort of very much four square behind us. So um, first I would say what I'm going to say is a complete evaluation. Nobody knows what was the original plan and how many changes and adaptations the Iranians made right. in the original plan. As I've said, I uh, believe that uh, things uh, play out uh, in general according to the plan. Uh, so I think that as long as this U.S. carrier is not shooting anything, it doesn't have any meaning. Uh, for Israelis, it has a huge meaning. The fact that uh, Biden sent this assistance and sent the carrier was very symbolic to encourage us after we were truly... Um, traumatized. Uh, yeah, we're yeah. still traumatized. Right. We're still traumatized. Right. But uh, whether this created deterrence to Iran or to Hezbollah, I am not sure. It takes more than that. And I think that you first, the carrier is no longer here. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and second, you see that uh, attacks uh, are happening every day uh, by the Houthis in the Red Sea. Um, we have a little bit less attacks, but still we have attacks against American forces in uh, Eastern uh, Syria and Iraq. It didn't stop completely yet. <clears throat> so I'm not sure that the carrier made a difference. Okay, fair enough. Um, okay, so I, I have one last question for you guys. It's by, by, um, by chance, the last question that's come up is, is, is an opportunity, Sarit, for you to leave us with a little bit of hope. So see, see, if, see what you can do. No, no, uh, you know, I'm, you, there's no, uh, there's no guarantee. We're not, a. No, no I, I can give you a few things. I, uh, I, let me just let me just let me just put this the way Helen the way Helen has put it, and you can answer it as you wish. But Helen basically says, "Is there something optimistic you can tell us about the future of the North of Israel?" Because she's hearing that there isn't a solution except a full scale war, which will result in huge casualties. So, how do we? How is she? How how can we get some sort of <clears throat> optimism from this scenario? No, no I, I, I can't say that. What I can say is that, uh, uh, you know, again, from, talking from a very personal level, yeah, uh, looking at uh, the performance of the IDF in Gaza, uh, even though Lebanon is much more challenging, and you, it's, as I've said, it's a different terrain, which is much more challenging, and Hezbollah is a different kind of enemy, I think that uh, IDF proved a high capability in combat. And even for us, it was a good surprise uh, because we didn't have war for many years. And, you know, uh, tens of th hundreds of thousands of reservists were drafted. Among them, 50,000 were drafted after they already ended their reserve service, which is an amazing number. Uh, imagine what it takes to train all of these. And they, many of them were not trained for many years because they were not active. Uh, so this is a huge success, what happened here. And I think the second thing that the Iranians and Hezbollah, when they made this plan, didn't expect is that the airplanes that will land in Ben Gurion airport will bring Israelis back into Israel to participate in the war rather than take Israelis away yeah. from Israel. And the Isra I think they were surprised by the Israeli spirit because they, they in their propaganda before the war, they said Israelis will leave, Israelis will pack, yeah. they will go back to their homelands. And mm. I think, uh, so I think this is the only thing that I have that encouraging that and that and the people of the north are stubborn. We love our home. And we want the gallery to prosper. And uh, I, I truly don't know what to wish for. I'm telling you the truth. I don't know what to wish for, yeah. even as an expert, but definitely as a mother here. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I always thought that uh, war is the worst case scenario. And I learned that there is another worst case scenario, which is a massacre. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, Thank you, Sarit, for coming on and for informing us of the situation. I think, as I said at the very beginning, it's something that we probably haven't been reading so much about and hearing so much about because the focus has been down south. Um, and it's, as I think should be clear to everyone now, if it wasn't an hour ago, um, is extremely important that we are aware of what's happening in the north and the, and the potential of what might happen in the north. Um, but I, I will just say, just to add to your comments at the end, that I think that what you did, the, the, the mistake that you described of Hezbollah and Iran, I think is the, is the general mistake that our enemies make, which is to think that we're this colonial, these colonialists who will go back to Europe, um, at the, once, uh, once the, uh, the, uh, pardon my French, the shit hits the fan. And um, and that's not been the case. The opposite is the case. And ain't none where it's a chayot. So this is uh, this is where we're staying. Um, thank you, Sarit, very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. 
there will be uh, more um, events uh, here at the Begin Centre and on Zoom in the coming weeks. So uh, please go to our website and uh, check those out. Go to our Facebook page. Uh, if you're on, not on my email list, then you can drop me an email, paulg at bagancenter.org.il, and I will um, update you on, on English events that we have in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again to Sarit Zahavi for a wonderful presentation, and baslacha. Um, Bye-bye. Bye-bye.